a look at the African case suggests that there are some, uh, some very big differences between what happened in Europe and what happened in Africa, and that the state is not always necessary to carry out the functions described in the beginning of this talk. Uh, I, I refer here to, to a study by Bob Bates on the study of cat. It's a study of cattle raising uh, society, the newer society in Sudan. So I want you to think about the basic functions of the state in terms of external security. This was a herding society. They needed to protect themselves from the outsiders, but they did it through norms, whereby there were it was expected that men of certain age from each clan in the area would come together to fight the outsiders. They didn't have a draft. They didn't have conscription. They didn't have highly bureaucratic structures. Instead, it was, it was again, it was based on these norms, feelings for what is proper, what is obligatory. Again, in terms of internal security, there was a system of deterrence based on norms and not formal institutions. If you take my cow, I'll take yours. And this was based in part on the knowledge that uh, everyone has this age-based role. Uh, and, and there's certain, a certain segment of society that will fight, uh, again, but, but based on norms. Um, there were arbitration mechanisms, um, quasi, a, a sort of quasi-judicial system, but not formalized, as in the European case. There was a mechanism for clear communication. There was the leopard skin chief who gathered the stories from all sides, who weighed the evidence, attesting to his legitimacy. Uh, but again, he was not a, a formal judge. Um, there was also peer pressure. Uh, which kept society together, and it kept the rules followed. Uh, so the process of state centralization in Africa, as you can imagine, was quite different than in Europe, where you had city-states fighting each other and, and trying to maximize efficiency and mimicking one another in this constant bid for, to, to overtake the others. Instead, in Africa, state centralization proceeded at a much slower pace. It was much more difficult. Because of two reasons. First of all, and this, these are basically related to demographics. First of all, the land was of very poor quality. And second of all, the population density was very low. What this meant is that you had to move around a lot because there was no good land. And that you can move around a lot without stepping on people's toes because there was so much land. In Europe, if you move a couple of miles, you're going to run into another group. In Africa, you move a couple of miles and you can go miles and miles and miles and not run into another group. So what all this meant is because of the demographics, there was no impetus to centralize. Who needs control of the land when it is not a scarce resource? It's not valuable. From the other side, in, in Africa, unlike in Europe, you had a frontier mentality. Given the large amounts of land, it's easy to pick up. It's easy to go if you don't like who you are living under or if they don't like you. Okay? So it was very easy uh, for people who came into conflict with one another, instead of to fight, or to, 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 to copy one another and their institutions, etc., like we saw in Europe, to just pick up and leave. Lots of land, none of it particularly valuable. Now, centralization did become easier and much more profitable where there were gains to be had in trade in certain parts of Africa, where trade routes gave the land a value and an incentive to guard it. And then, if you're guarding it with a standing army, then you need to collect taxes to support it. And you have a more a, a process of evolution that's more similar to the European case. But for much of Africa, there was a very slow centralization process uh, thanks to these demographics. Uh, and what this meant is that African... Um, hmm, they weren't states, they were proto-states. Maybe African peoples, uh, I should say, I guess, were really easy targets for colonizers in the late 18th century and, and some before that. So how do, now we'll move on, um, talk a little bit about defining the state. We, we define state power. Oh. Sorry, pause. So in this class, when we talk about state power, we're talking about the ability to accomplish, accomplish basic objectives, define, defend the borders, ensure order, uh, ensure the collection and allocation of revenue. And we refer to two aspects here, capacity and autonomy. By capacity, we mean the ability to carry out basic tasks. And here's a quote from your textbook of providing security and reconciling freedom and equality. By autonomy, we mean the ability of the state to wield its power independently of the public. Okay? So this is basically control over the public. Now in this class, <clears throat> we focus on the domestic public. Uh, in your book, it, they may uh, conflate this with sovereignty. So the ability, autonomy, 
um, in an in international context. We usually refer to that as sovereignty. So again, when we talk about autonomy here, think of it in the domestic context. So we'll start with capacity. Uh, this is the capabilities to, quote, carry out actions or policies within a territory independent from external actors or internal rivals. Um, in other words, serve as the primary authority which can create and execute laws and regulations and resist outside interference and ensure order and stability at home. So this necessitates power. Uh, the power to fight off external and internal threats, other state actors and non-state actors. Okay? Um, this vague notion of power is made concrete through institutions. Things like the police, the military, the tax collectors. Apart from power, these institutions also transform political ideas uh, into concrete policies. So the agricultural, uh, agriculture department, for example, um, might be told to allocate land but then they decide exactly how to allocate the land um, through the executive. The Defense Department uh, is told how to best secure the borders, but they come up with the, the exact policies for winning a war. Okay? No one legislates how to win the war. Uh, the State Department is told to regulate relations with other countries, and they come up with a strategy for regulating those relations. Okay? The laws are often vague. The state apparatus has to transform these opaque guidelines into a policy blueprint. Now, uh, when we talk about autonomy, we're talking about the degree to which the state can operate independently of society or groups within society. So think, for example, in the United States, uh, in the first Obama term, the passage of the, of the health care reform legislation. There was a strong role of interest groups, representatives from the pharmaceuticals, from hospitals, insurance companies, groups of uninsured people. What this shows is a very low level of autonomy in the U.S. state, okay? State being the, the, the federal state, okay? Uh, it's all 50 states, for the record. Um, if you had a higher level of autonomy, Obama could have passed his health care plan without societal interference. Okay? But instead, uh, in, in a low autonomy state, you have the influence of society. And this, by definition, is a democracy. A democracy, by definition, is going to be low autonomy. The more liberal democracy, the more uh, consolidated democracy it is, the lower autonomy that state is going to have because you have various access points for citizens to contribute to the state and to put pressure on lawmakers. Autonomy can be a function of coercion, but it can also arise out of legitimacy. And states gain legitimacy through various mechanisms, but often via their governments. Remember the difference between a state and a government. The government is the elites who run the state, the state being the organizations. So there are three types of legitimacy. Uh, there, there you have st uh, an example of strong states before we get into legitimacy. Um, the ability to provide public goods, the capacity, and the ability to limit public goods without consequences. Now note that strong state here is not a normative, normative um, there's, there's no normative meaning that we put in here. A strong state is just one that's able to provide public goods and to limit public goods without consequences um, when it wants to. And also the ability to maintain public acceptance or legitimacy. So we'll come back to the Somalia case in a couple minutes. But by legitimacy, uh, we refer to these three types, traditional legitimacy, charismatic legitimacy, and rational legal legitimacy. By traditional le legitimacy, we mean that this is the way it's always been done. Okay? Uh, monarchs, because of their history, the culture, the norms, whatever it is, reinforced by rituals and ceremonies. Monarchies are self-perpetuating. Why do we listen to the queen? She's a total drunkard. She can't make it. She's incompetent. She can't make a, a decision. Well, we listen to her when she does make those decisions because that's the way it's always been. This is traditional legitimacy. Charismatic legitimacy is based on the power of ideas and personalities. Often these are based on very simple messages, um, simple answers for all the world's problems, and then the ability to convey these effectively and convincingly. So Hitler and Stalin did a wonderful job of this, unfortunately. And finally, rational legal legitimacy, uh, where legitimacy is derived through a system of laws and procedures that are highly institutionalized. Uh, someone comes to power through elections, so it's assumed that they're going to pursue or serve the public interest, the interest of those who elected that person. Now, a couple important points. State power 
does not mean centralization. There can be a centralized uh, unitary state where political power is concentrated at the national level in order to ensure efficiency. Or it can be a decentralized state where there's a federalist state where much authority is given to regional or local bodies, for example, to preserve local interests. But this doesn't mean that the state is, is, uh, is powerful or not powerful. Um, and let me go back. Um, just to give you an idea, states with high capacity and high autonomy, um, states like China, like the former Soviet Union, these are states that could that had the means, the technological means, uh, and the money, in many cases, to do what they wanted to, or the military means to do what they wanted to, and they didn't have to listen to their people. China doesn't have to listen to its people. States with high capacity and low autonomy are countries like the United States, Western Europe, Japan, advanced democracies. And then states that lack autonomy and capacity are many in Africa. And these are many of the failing or failed states, which brings us back to the case of Somalia. Um, and I apologize for showing that slide for so long. Um, but Somalia is a state with low capacity and low autonomy. It's a failed state. How did it get there? Well, various clan leaders, some supported from abroad, uh, for example, from Ethiopia, felt marginalized under Bari who spoke out against clan politics, but actually manipulated clan politics through his political alliances. Opponents gained a following of armed supporters and fought their way towards Mogadishu, eventually pushing Bari out of power. Yet all of them wanted power for themselves. And so the traditional government sought to divvy up parliamentary spaces based on clans. Of course, this was complicated and contentious. And ultimately, the clans decided they wanted power in place of the state. And this is what's led to a failed state in Somalia. And this is perpetuated today. So that's all for the state, uh, the, the state lecture, and we'll go on in the next section.